this talk on data modeling with graphs and how we use the graph database Neo4j to help us automate the balancing of a complex in-game economy that we had. We're going to start by spending a few minutes uh, talking about the game itself to lay down the premise of the problem that we try to solve. And then we're going to discuss how we model the entire game as a graph in Neo4j. And we're going to take a little short detour and look at some of the tooling that we built and some of the challenges that we had to tackle along the way. And we will wrap up by looking at some of the bonus use cases that we had for our graph model once we had those data. All in all, I expect the session to take around 35 to 40 minutes. Uh, we should give, give us plenty of time for questions and to get ahead in the lunch queue. But my name is Yen Chui, and I often go by the online alias of The Burning Monk, and I work for a company called Gamesys. We are based in central London, and we are one of the market leaders in the real money gaming business. My team, however, we focus on freemium model games for a more social audience. And as the backend developer there, I have built a backend for a number of our social games on both Facebook and mobile. Across our social games today, we have around a million daily active users and around 250 million requests per day. And pretty much every action user takes in our games are recorded and analyzed. To that, we, record, we capture something around the two to three terabytes of data every month just for analytics purpose. It uh, doesn't take into account of the significant amount of data that we generate and store to facilitate the actual gameplay for players. For today's talk, we're going to talk about one of our games in particular, an uh, MMORPG called Hippie Monsters, which is a location-based game where everything is happening in a world that's similar to medieval Earth, except all the monsters in your local folklores and legends, they are real and they, work, uh, they live in harmony with this species of elf-like natives until one day, this mysterious starium starts to fall from the sky and they drive all the monsters crazy whenever they land. So your job as a hero in the game is to, in part, capture, uh, catch these um, uh, corrupted monsters and cure them. And there are over 500 different places for you to visit in the game. Each takes after a town or a city that exists in the real world, real world in that period and the time period and on every continent there's also a town where you can find loads of different shops and NPCs as well as other players who are just chilling out between quests. It's an episodic story driven game. Uh, the storyline is broken up into seasons and episodes. Season 1 started in London back in 2012 and took the player to all over Europe to Germany, Spain and Italy, just uh, to name a few. And season two then took the players to the Far East, to Nanjing, which is the ancient capital of China. And along the way, the players also had to travel to Japan and Korea and had to work with the clan of secret ninjas. It's a multiplayer game, and pretty much anywhere you go in the game right now, you find other players uh, there just to do the same quest that you are or to catch monsters and there's a global chat system where you can go and ask for help whenever you're stuck on quest and you don't know what to do next. You can also ask players that you find the game as you travel around to be your in-game buddies and you can help each other out with uh, gifts or answer questions and unlike many other games we don't, f we don't force you to uh, make friends in order to progress and force you to spam your Facebook friends for gifts. And right now we have players playing on a number of different platforms and the game itself is localized in both English and Brazilian Portuguese. Lastly, it's a role-playing game and has many of the same gameplay elements that you are probably familiar with from other RPGs already. And as you travel around the world, you encounter NPCs and you also find items in a, in a, a number of different ways. There are approximately 4,000 items in the game right now and the items that you find on your travels and those that you can grow at home they can then be combined together to make more interesting and more powerful items using any one of 800 recipes that's in the game we have spent a lot of time researching and making sure that everything that you find in the game is where they should be in the real world and one of the constant pieces of feedback that we get from our players is that they find the game educational as well as fun to play 
And we also hear from players that they have learned about places and butterflies that they didn't know existed before. And the NPCs that you encounter, they also give you quests. And there are plenty of quests in the game. And this quest, some of these are optional and others are main quest line. They push you along the storyline. Monster trapping is also a big part of the game. And to catch monsters, you need to be at the right place and using the right combination of trap and bait. There are over 100 different monsters in the game and more are added every couple other weeks. And different type of monster requires different type of traps. And besides all these things you can do in the game already, you also have a homestead that you can tend to and manage your resources and there are different ways for you to use your creative energy as some of our more creative players has demonstrated and one of the challenges that we face and many other game developers like us is in making sure that the game is well balanced in terms of its content and there are many different aspects of this one of which is the game economy itself so if you take an entry level camouflage trap at the top of the screen there it take, it's one of the very first traps that you make in the game but it's made from a number of different ingredients from the basic box trap to the camouflage paint to an oak tree and the camouflage paint itself is made from a number of different other paints and so on and so forth and if you raise the price of a basic ingredient like water that price change, that increase needs to bubble all the way up the ladder and when you look at how many different items are made from water and how many more items are made from those there is a huge knock-on effect here and if you fail to address this knock-on effect you will create an arbitrage opportunity in your economy that players can exploit they may be able to easily make money by buying and selling items and they have less need to make real money purchases with us and this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of game balancing and in general, trying to balance the game of this kind of scale and scope is super slow and is repetitive and worst of all, the results is error prone and the results are highly subjective. What feels right to one person can be completely off the chart for another. Other people have, tried, have attempted to solve this problem by throwing warm bodies and the man hours at it, but we have a very small team behind the project and we want to work smarter and more efficiently and find a solution, uh, an approach that allows us to stay agile and be able to generate and release contents to our players quickly. And what we needed was a more scientific and systematic approach. And that is where Neo4j comes in. So if you take Bigfoot as an example, if you look at the, his Armanac page in the game, which is a sort of uh, in-game Wikipedia, you can see where in the world you can find him and you can see what loot drops he gives uh, when you catch him and what trap you need to make to catch him as well as your chance of catching him using this particular trap uh, different monsters like different baits they don't just take whatever you give them so you have to use the right bait and depending on the bait that you use you have a different chance of attracting him to your trap in the first place and if you put all that information for that screen into a graph, you end up with something like this, where the monster, the trap, bait, loot, and locations, they're all represented as nodes in a graph. They are connected by edges. Every node and every edge can have an arbitrary set of properties associated with them. So for a monster and a trap, you have their stats. And based on that stat, we calculate a percentage chunk, a catch rate that you have for this, um, for this monster. So here we can say that the can catch relationship between Bigfoot and the Musketeer trap has a catch rate of 77.4% uh, expressed as a decimal here. And similarly, every item will have some uh, attributes associated with them, which varies depending on the type of item you're talking about. But usually they will include both the buy and sell price. Since Bigfoot drops the toenail clipping as a loot, we also need to remember the loot drop chance for that loot relationship, you see. And all the, no, all the relationships here are directed as well, and if you extend this graph to include other related nodes, you start to bring other monsters and traps, as well as other items, into the view. 
And from here, you can see that the Bigfoot can be caught by using the musketeer trap, which can also catch the Yowie and the Yeti. And to make the bait for Bigfoot, you need to craft it using the alluring goat recipe, which can be crafted in the apprentice workshop using, a, well, combined, by combining the goat, some honey, and a piece of Yeti fur. And you can buy the goat from a donor's farm in London, and you can harvest honey by building a beehive at home. But to get the Yeti fur, you need to first catch the Yeti, which requires its own bait, which you need to make by combining other ingredients, and the cycle just continues. And in fact, if you go all the way back out to see the game, this is what you end up with when you look at when you take every item, quest, location, and NPC as a node, and let the size of a node uh, to rep the size of the node represent the number of connections in and out of them. It's not a particularly big graph, to be honest. It's only got about 800, uh, sorry, 8,000 nodes, but it's, fairly highly, it's quite highly connected with over 40,000 con uh, connections between them. And there are many outliers there where you have hundreds of connections in and out of the nodes. For instance, a common monster such as the sylph exists in many parts of the world and he can be caught using a number of different traps and baits and similarly basic ingredients such as uh, water is used in many different cooking recipes which are then used in many other cooking recipes so with that now that we're able to model, model the game as a graph let's see what we can use how we can use it from the item pricing example we saw earlier the key challenge there was to, uh, was to understanding the impact of change and this is not any different to the sort of things that people do in finance where they work in derivative pricing so when something changes there's a bunch of knock-on effects you need to be able to understand what those knock-on effects mean in terms of pricing or products that are derived from those things and if you take the white bread as example to work out the blast radius of a price change for white bread let's look at the relationship that exists between an item and the recipe an item is used in a recipe which crafts another item and to find all the items that are made from white bread either directly or indirectly using cipher which is the built-in lang query language for Neo4j we can write something like this this query looks for any item which are connected to white bread either through at least one instance of either its used in or craft relationship and there's a couple of things to know from this query here if you're not familiar with the Neo4j. First, we can pattern match against relationships using this arrow like syntax where we say there's a direct relationship from a node on the left to a node on the right, and the relationship can be captured using this uh, square bracket notation in the middle. We can also filter the nodes by type on either side of this relationship. <coughs> And we can also apply an additional filter based on the value of properties associated with those nodes. And we can do the same thing with the relationship. So here we are saying that we are looking for specifically relationships of type craft or is used in. And for this query to match, we need at least one instance of this relationship somewhere, anywhere between, any between two nodes. Um, finally, we can return the, the nodes that we've, uh, we've matched and the relationship using the return keyword. And the result of this query looks something like this. Where the, where the purple edges, uh, where the purple nodes are items and uh, the red nodes are recipes. So from here, we can see that white bread is, is, uh, is used directly in one, two, three, four, five, in 10 different recipes and indirectly in another five. So whenever you make a change to the price of white bread, all 15 of these other items that are made from them, from white bread, need to have their prices adjusted as well. But not all items can be priced using this model because they're not derivatives of others. Some need to be priced manually based on a number of different factors such as their, uh, their scarcity in the world, like the fruits that you can forage from fruit trees as you travel around. So the next question we need to want to answer is that based on the following relationship where <coughs> fruits are foraged from fruit trees which exist in spots how scarcely are available, uh, how scarcely available are fruits such as 
durian and dragon fruit. Both are we know we know both are exotic fruits that only exist in warmer climates than here. And to find out, we can write something along well, along this line. And like the first example here, we can like the first example, we can pattern match against the relationship between three different nodes on either side of this of, of this uh, node in the middle with two different type of relationships using this uh, similar using the same notation that we saw earlier. But we can also use the where clause to say, okay, well, now that we match a, a fruit and a spot and a tree that matches our pattern, we want to filter on the fruit node so that we only look for fruits whose name is either durian or dragon fruit. And the result of this query looks, looks like this. And from here, you can straight away see that durian is much harder to come by compared to dragon fruit. So naturally, it should be made more expensive to purchase. What you don't see from this view is that the existing relationship also contains the count of how many instances of how many trees that exist in that particular spot, which is something that our model actually takes into account when it makes a query. And so you can see from the Almanac page where in the world you can find durian and that you can buy a pack of five durian for three banknotes. And by comparison, Dragon fruit is a third, of, a third of the price because it's much more readily available in the world. Our model also takes into account other, things, uh, other factors such as how many pieces of fruit do you get from one particular forage action when you click on a, on a fruit tree in the world. And then to look at the quests, understand how they relate to other terms, you have this relationship here where some quests require you to gather and collect items to complete and when you complete them, they award other items as outcome and when you complete the quest, it also unlocks other follow-up quests so there's a cyclic relationship there between quests and other quest nodes so if you want to find out what is the quest that comes well, the quest that comes after you complete Year of the Horse we can write a very simple query here to match against the two quest nodes on the other side of the unlocks relationship, which originates from the quest called a year of the horse. Which from here we can see that you can, okay, once you complete that quest, you unlock five more quests for you to do. And again, if you step back and, and all the way out to see how all the quests tie together in the game, you get something like this which is uh, well, fairly indecisible. Uh, but somewhere along, somewhere in this ball of tweet, there's a single thread of quest line which takes you from the very first, game, first quest in the game to the very latest. But just being to see, visualize how quests tie together is only useful you know, to, some to, uh, to some extent. What is more interesting is an idea that we experimented with but haven't perfected in using the quest and how it relates to item to, to give us indication as to how difficult that particular quest is so that we can, we can build up a smooth progression in terms of the, the difficulty of the quest that we give to the players especially at the start of the game so that they don't get bored and disinterested because oh, I can't do this quest not, not, with, uh, not without spending some money or spend five hours you know, grafting we want to make sure that it's a smooth progression so quest becomes slightly harder and harder but never so hard that you can't do them and this is actually one area where games like World of Warcraft is really, really good at. In that whole game, you're never ever asked to do anything that you're not ready to do at that stage, at any stage in the game. But I think for World of Warcraft, they spend a lot of time on QA and, and, and demand resource in order to make sure that the game plays well and that the smooth progression is there that exists in the game. And with our pricing model in full, uh, in full, in full swing, we can price baseline items using factors such as scarcity and calculate the price of items that derive from those space items and the price of an item should then also be a reflection of how difficult it is to obtain that item in the first place and once you've done that hard work of pricing the items you can now use that output to enrich your original model and you can then price the quest in a very similar way based on the items that they require so cheaper quests should come before more expensive ones and they should also award less valuable items as a result. And for trapping, while well, some monsters need to, it need to be caught as part of the main storyline, uh, others don't have to be caught in any particular order. In fact, there's a lot of monsters that's in the game 
you don't have to catch them at all. It's up to you, and the players are free to, but encouraged to go off and do their own thing and explore everything that we have built in this world, and they can get achievements and rewards for taking the initiative and making new traps and catch monsters in their own. And to catch a monster, you need to use uh, the right bait, and to make that bait, you often have to find ingredients that are only available as loot drops from other monsters. So again, we have this relationship where a monster loots some item, which is used in some recipe to craft some other items that can attract another monster. And based on this set of relationships, we can actually establish a hierarchy a monster set of monsters with a very simple cipher query like this. And if you use Bigfoot as an example for monster 2 in this query, you get something along this line. And from here you can see that um, to make the bait, the alluring go for Bigfoot, you need, to use, you need to craft it with that recipe, which amongst other things requires yeti fur, fiery hair and golden hair which are loot drops from other monsters on the outside of, the, of, the, of this graph. And this place Bigfoot at the top of this particular hierarchy and you can iteratively go through all the monsters in the game and do the same thing based on the loot and the bait information, work out a sub-hierarchy with that particular monster at the top. You can then replace every monster you find in this hierarchy here with the monster sub-hierarchy and you can start to build up and over, overall hierarchy for all the monsters in the game from the very, the very simple, the simple is most common monsters to very rare monsters like Bigfoot and I think in Argentina there is meant to be a, a cow-fish hybrid I can't remember the name of that uh, but it's, 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 it's in the game I've, I've gone there and caught it before uh, and when you do catch a monster you might get some item as loot as well as uh, some coins as a reward from the Ministry of Monsters and if you think about it from a high level, for, uh, trapping as an action has a very simple equation where on the left hand side you have the price of the bait and taking into account the effectiveness of that bait, of those baits. On the right hand side you have the price of the loot as well as their drop rates, but also the, uh, the, the amount of gold that you get for, catch, for successfully catching a monster. Actually, what we're missing here is the probability of, uh, of catch rate. So the amount of gold that we reward is now derived from the price of the various components and the likelihood uh, of happening. And since we know the price of loot are then factored into the price of the next monster in the hierarchy, we can now use the impact analysis that we saw earlier as, um, in the earlier example and maintain the balance of this earlier that simple equation throughout our entire hierarchy so that when one thing changes, uh, we know, okay, because that price of the bait changed, so the price that we award for catching that monster needs to change, and the, uh, if we want to change the price of the bait, that have then have a knock-on effect on further up the hierarchy if that, uh, that loot is used to create bait for other monsters and other monsters and other monsters. And the model also looks at all the ecosystem of all the monsters as a whole because when we introduce a new monster to a region, it will impact your likelihood of being uh, to attract any other monsters in this whole in, this, in the same region because now there are more competitors for a small pool of different baits they can use. So we've seen how we can make use of the data once it's inside Neo4j. Uh, let's take a little detour and have a look at the pipeline and some of the tooling that we've built to get data into Neo4j in the first place. For heavy monsters, we actually built a custom CMS which is internally known as TNT, where every item, quest, NPC, location, and achievements, as well as any other game design related data, they're all stored. And with TNT, we wanted to solve a number of different problems that we had with our previous approaches. Firstly, we want to make sure that we have proper version control of our game design data. This was of paramount importance because the scope and the scale of the game demanded and the difficulty in tracking down subtle and hard to reproduce the quest bugs. And in order to to achieve the level of agility, but at the same time having the confidence you need 
in releasing content to our players quickly and frequently, we need to have clear visibility into data changes between releases as well as the accountability for those who are making those changes. And to maximize the, uh, the productivity of our small team of four game designers, we also need to allow multiple game designers to work on data at the same time without stepping on each other's toes. And we as developers, we all know that this is what Git is for. So we basically build a very thin layer in TMT on top of Git and support the Git flow branching strategy, which is already used by all of our developers anyway. So it was easy to teach, it, teach the same approach to our game designers so that they understand how, the, how you go from uh, develop to feature to release branch to master to tagging release builds. And we have to actually build tools so that we, they can actually log into Team City and press a button to do most of these things themselves. But before every release, we have a little sit down between the developers and the game designers to talk about, okay, here's all the changes that, that, uh, that you guys have made. Do any of these things scare any of your developers? There may be things that the game designer may not be aware of, but limitations in the, uh, in the system that doesn't work quite the same way that they thought. So that's a good time to iron out those last minute you know, things that could go wrong in production. And TNT works in tandem with a publishing service that is responsible for validation, localization, as well as generating data in the format as required by the different consumers, which include both the client platforms, the server, as well as exporting data into Neo4j so that we can do more analysis and the running economic reports on those data in Neo4j. With the publisher, uh, we are able to publish and load data that's generated from specific data branches in Git so that you're able to use our dev environment, uh, our shared dev environment, test your data in isolation. And if you're working on a quest line that's not going to go out for another month, you can still publish and load your specific branch of data in dev without affecting anyone else who is using dev for doing other stuff, doing their own testing or uh, testing release candidate. Yep. So you are editing your data yep. in another format than the actual Neo4j database? Yes. Yeah. There's the there's data that's edited in the CMS. There's a little uh, forms that you can you can you can you can you can, uh, you can fill in details on, so they're easy for the game designers to work with, and uh, they they often then transform the different formats and store it in Git, and then the publishing service would take those data, transform them again uh, into say AMF encoded files for a Flash. Uh, it also does a bunch of uh, pre-compilation, so based on the data you've, you, you've, uh, you've given us, rather than working out at one time what cache rate you have between this trap and this monster, we just pre-compute them and store them as part of data. So if you're going to change the price of something and mm -hmm. playing with it in the Neo4j database, actually you have to do yep. You don't do it straight. In we have some tools that allows you to, some, to kind of work out based on the data we have today. If you make that change, what's going to happen? But that too is still quite rudimentary. So a lot of time the game designer would you go and make that change, well make the change that they want to do, and then they run a report after they made a change based on the data in Neo4j that okay, because you changed that, now you have to change all these hundred different things. And then yeah. Sounds uh, impossible Not too bad actually. We also make tools so that they can just take that output of hundred different things and what they are, and we, as part of the process, we give them recommended buy and sell prices for this item that they've changed, because, well, for the things that they are impacted by their change, and then they can just take that, put it into a CSV, and upload it uh, to a web tool that we built so that that will update the data in the CMS. So, that's, so it's not just, a, well, we, as part of the thing that we did with the CMS, we initially wanted to build it on top of Neo4j so that when you make a change, we tell you straight away, hey, you, you changed that, so here's our hundred other things that you should change. Uh, but we have never actually got to that point, so that <coughs> workflow is now out, out of the CMS, but it's still available and just a few button clicks ultimately. Uh, right. Right. Um, so yeah, you can you can yeah. So once you've done that, you can then say okay, publish what I've done so far, mm -hmm. and that gets <coughs> that gets published to an available on the dev environment that you can load with just your data for you. So uh, someone else will be testing a different feature. They can use the same uh, same the same um, dev environment, but they'll be loading their own data set. 
which also gives us the capabilities to release data to production to, do, uh, to run smoke tests without making it available and visible to all the players until we're happy with it, just in case there are some minor differences between the different uh, environments that we didn't catch in the staging environment and somehow something got out to production and realized, oh, right. <laughs> Another problem that we tried to solve was uh, localization. As the editing data in the CMS, uh, we, we, have, we have all these um, uh, Python model objects, uh, classes that model different entities, and we can tag different uh, fields as require localization. And then there's a part of the CMS that's a tool for you to you know, gather all of those things and put them into a, a, a kind of the, the profile so that we can send it off to localizers. And when they are done, they send it back to us. We load it up to the CMS so it's available when we publish data to the publisher. And traditionally, with uh, localization, you do that on the client where the client will inject some get text translation file. And uh, whenever you want to display some text, you will swap out the, uh, the, the original string with the localized ver version. But since the game has more text than the first three Harry Potter books combined, that's a lot of text and they're very expensive to, to, to localize and it's spread over a hundred different classes. So we decided to implement this change on the server instead so that we don't have duplicate effort on different clients. And the publisher, in this case, will ingest some translation file in the get text format. <coughs> you will then use PostSharp, which is a framework for doing aspect-only programming on .NET, to intercept setter methods on any string properties on DTO classes, and you will replace the string for you with the localized version, if it exists, a lo if a localized version exists. At the end of this, you will generate a set of localized DTOs that can then be serialized and consumed by the different clients. And if there are more within one language that we need to localize for, we should repeat the same process and do, uh, do the same thing for the next language. And to do that, we wrote a little localized attribute that looks, that's about 30 lines of code there, which is applied to any string properties that when you call a setter on those properties, it, this, the code body here will run and we check against the stress static uh, context to see whether or not we are in localization mode. If not, skip. Otherwise, you would look at the, you would use the get text file that is ingested to, to translate the string and then invoke the setter method as if you had called the setter with the localized string instead. And then we have one line of code to just apply this to all of our DTO classes. And this covers about 95% of our localization work and took me about an hour to write. And whenever we need to add a new type that requires localization, it's all done automatically without me having to do any more work. Another challenge that we had was, um, automate, was working on how to automate the process of tuning the trap and monster stats so that we achieve the, the catch where we want. Every monster and every trap's got matching stats, and by comparing these two sets of stats, we calculate some catch rate percentage between them. And the formula used to, catch, uh, to, to work out this catch rate takes into account other factors like uh, traps have different affinities with different monsters and different type of monsters. So some traps are weak against the uh, air monsters, others are strong against the sea monsters, and then you have uh, seasonal monsters like the jack o, o lantern, which is only available during Halloween. And even though it's not very strong stats-wise, it can only be caught by a, a special trap that's available during Halloween only. And it used to be that the game designer have to manually trial and error until they get to until they converge on, a, on, on some number that's, that kind of works. And this, of, you know, this approach is of course error prone, it's laborious and it's very unlikely to yield the optimal answer that you want. And you also sometimes end up with stats that just doesn't make any sense, like pixies that are strong but slow or trolls that are actually smart. So instead we develop a set of a genetic algorithms in F-sharp that will search and find the optimal solution for you based on a set of uh, criteria that is specified such as the intended catch rate for each monster for this particular trap, an error margin you're willing to accept and an initial set of stats that defines the ideal distribution of stats that you want. So if you want a trap that makes sense so that it's high tech but not very really strong, but quite fast. You can, so you tell us that at the start so that we try to find a solution that matches your shape. And to run the algorithm, the game designer just go on our web tool, 
put in a few parameters, error margin, and click the button and wait for the answers to come back. And in terms of a genetic algorithm, uh, in simple terms, is takes it starts with a set of uh, solu potential solutions and it iteratively generate new generations of solutions using a selection and a mutation process. The selection process would choose which of the current solutions will survive based on the fitness test. The mutation process then takes each of the surviving solutions and generates new solutions from that. And this iteration continues until either you found solutions that you want or you've, run, you've uh, which the maximum number of generations that you are allowed to run. In particular, our algorithm, it starts with a set of stats for our trap and the selection process then calculates the catch rate for each of the target monsters and using this, uh, using this particular solution and keeps solutions only if it's better than a solution that is mutated from. And then the mutation process will take each of the surviving solutions and tweak the numbers slightly so you add and remove a small amount on each of the stats or a large amount on each of the stats so that you generate solutions that are slightly better when you're close to the, to the answer or noticeably different when you're far away from the answer. So this is an example when you, you, when you have, when you're starting with a, a, st a stats of 100, 100, 200, we tweak the different stats in a different number of ways. And this continues until either we exhausted the maximum number of generations we want to run, or we, or none of the new solutions that uh, none of the new solutions survive our selection process, which means we can't find an answer based on your criteria. And we've done the same thing for baits, uh, but slightly more involved because for baits, the fitness test, well, the attraction rate of between the bait and the monster is location sensitive, as we saw earlier, and changes depending on the number of other monsters that exist in the same area. Uh, okay, thank you. They exist in the same area, so that might compete for the same bait. So for the fitness test, we actually required a full-on simulation using that bait on every location in the world for every mutation. So it's computationally quite expensive and takes longer to actually converge on an answer, but in principle, it's very similar. And you use a very similar tool, tool, well, similar tool to, to get your answers as well. So that's our detour. And once we got our data in Neo4j, it turns out there were some other bonus use cases that we didn't think of at, at first. For instance, um, some time ago, we, we made the decision to rewrite the entire season one. It was a big undertaking, but it was one that we thought was necessary because after running the game for more than a year, we learned a lot about how to write good content that our players enjoy and our, our systems are more mature and more features are available so we can make better quests and we want to show new players coming to the game the best we have to offer and give them something that's more fun to play with a more uh, focus and streamline the storyline and the greater focus on quality over quantity and I think the guys did a great job considering the, the task that they had to do to take well, about a year's worth of work take them apart and then put them back together uh, to make for a better experience for our players. But uh, the big downside is that you now have twice as much content to support, which is um, really tough for our QA and our support team, especially the support team who have to answer all kinds of queries from the users. Okay, so now you have half of your users on one storyline, the other half on the other. When someone asks you, what happened, what do I need to do in this quest? You have to now first figure out which, which branch they're on and then you know, answer the question based on where they are on that particular branch. So there's a, there's a massive uh, ad, additional ad on the cognitive load, which also impacts other developers and game designers as well, not to the same extent to the custom support. So again, we build some tools on top of data that we have in Neo4j, including some, some, some simple visualization tool to help them, okay, based on this branch, the display on this branch, and, and uh, where he is, uh, so we can answer questions like what quests are unlocked at what point and what I when are items have become available based on the where they are in the quest line. And I've been using Neo4j for quite a while and I'm still you know, excited to you know, buy the sort of things I can do and I'm constantly finding new things that I can do with Neo4j. So kudos to the guys who's you know, the, the guys at NewTech who's, who's done this work and uh, Jim Weber who's the Chief Science Officer 
for new attack is to give him a talk after lunch on new 4J on graph theories if you're interested. And that's why I've got. Uh, I'm going to be around for the rest of the conference. You're going to catch me up to talk about anything else you want. And you can also reach me on social media and my blog. And I think we've got some time for questions. Okay. Okay, there's one question there. Uh, hi. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, you said that you had this, um, like this pipeline in which uh, the designers make the changes and then you run some processing tools um, to actually uh, import the, the changes to Neo4j, right? Yeah. Uh, so I was just wondering what um, what would be the um, order of magnitude be of of the time it takes to run such updates, you know, or to integrate the changes to the Neo4j database? Is that like mm, is it an offline process or uh, is is well okay uh, like w where where you actually make the changes, like commit to the changes that designers wanted to to the database? It takes a couple of minutes, and also with uh, well, we wanted to build it into the CMS itself, but ultimately the time constraint is that we couldn't do it. We had to get a CMS ready so that people are not editing data in XML files and Google spreadsheets, uh, which is not scalable for the sort of things that we want to do in this game. And something that we looked at again, but just haven't you know, found the time to do it. And we also build tools that means it's it's there, it's workable slightly more painful than it should be and less real time but it's workable by now so that we are more focused on building other things but it's something that we want to go back to and build on top of Neo4j which means you can literally say make a change tell me what, what, else, what else I need to do and work out based on the model what price change should occur for each of the things that you are impacting and just say apply them all that is the ultimate look, uh, goal that we want to achieve where do we get there? I don't know <laughs> cool thanks Okay, if no question, then we can get stuffy on the lunch queue. <laughs>